Give them a couple of minutes to kind of click in here. Hi, everyone. Welcome. As people are just kind of pouring in, good evening. We're sorry, we're just a few minutes delayed. We'll just give it two more seconds just to let some other people log in and get settled before we start. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much um, for joining us. Just wanna thank you all for taking time out of your schedules to participate in our community event this evening hosted by Stronger Together. Stronger Together is the town's employee resource group for black, indigenous, and people of color. Um, with me this evening is my colleague, Alexandra Tez McNeil. Uh, Alexandra is the assistant superintendent for human resources for Needham Public Schools. Also, our guest speaker uh, for this evening is Dr. Otoyan Fayemi. Dr. Fayemi specializes in pediatrics at Hyde Park Pediatrics. He's a graduate of Yale University with a bachelor's in architecture. Dr. Fayemi received his doctor of medicine degree from Harvard Medical School. His internship and residency in pediatrics were performed at Children's Hospital in Boston. And he spent two years after residency working in the emergency room at Children's Hospital. Dr. Fiamy will discuss the impacts of COVID-19 in communities of color <clears throat> evening for us. My name is Rachel Glisper and I serve as the HR director for the town. Um, so we'll turn it over shortly, just um, at the conclusion of the presentation, um, we will be able to take questions. Um, there'll be a Q&A section for you to submit your questions during the presentation. We welcome your questions and we'll try our very best to get to as many questions as we can during our allotted time. And Alex um, is going to make an announcement just about interpretation. Uh, uh, and it will be in Spanish. Uh, in bienvenidos Spanish. a nuestra presentación esta noche, pero uh, estamos teniendo, uh, íbamos a tener traducción, uh, pero el intérprete no ha podido entrar en la reunión. So esperamos que pronto vamos a tener la oportunidad de traducir la presentación en español. Um, Si hay alguien en la llamada que necesita la presentación en español, por, por favor, echa la mano para arriba en términos, si puede um, oprimir el raise hands um, símbolo que está, eh, que es una, como una mano levantada abajo para saber cuánta gente en esta llamada necesita la traducción. Gracias. So I've just asked folks to uh, raise your, use the raise hands feature um, so that we know who needs uh, interpretation. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and at this time, we will turn it over to Dr. Fayemi. Great, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Olatory Fayemi. I'm a resident of Needham and a father of two. I've been a pediatrician at High Park Pediatrics for a little over 20 years. And tonight I'm gonna to talk to you about racial disparities uh, related to COVID-19 and how communities of color are disproportionately affected by this pandemic. I'd like to start with a review of the data outlining these discrepancies and some reasons that might account for these discrepancies. I'd also like to take a shallow dive into historical events which have placed communities of color at higher risk during the pandemic. I thought I'd start first with the worst outcome of COVID, which would be death. These relative percentages represent people from all age groups since the beginning of the pandemic. The data shows that people of color represent a higher percentage of deaths when compared to the percent they represent in the population. However, the story is very different when you break these numbers down according to age. As more and more of the older population is immunized, the share of COVID cases has increased in our youth. When we look at children and young adults, it's clear that communities of color, especially Hispanic and Black Americans have significantly higher rates of death than their white counterparts. This trend continues with young adults from 25 to 34 years of age and onto middle-aged adults as well. 
In fact, this trend continues until we reach adults age 65 years and older. Among communities of color, death from COVID-19 is significantly higher than their white counterparts. What is also evident is that when people of color are infected with COVID-19, they're more likely to have severe illness. In this graphic, you can see that hospitalizations and death are two and a half to three times higher for people of color when compared to the general population. Now, mortality and morbidity is not the only metric that has disproportionately affected communities of color. Unemployment and financial insecurity have hurt our communities as well. These graphs represent unemployment rates starting from the beginning of this year. This group of graphs represents men of different age groups. The blue line represents white Americans, the red line, black Americans, and the gray line, Hispanic Americans. As you can see in the graph, unemployment increases for all groups throughout this year. Rates of black unemployment rose about the same rate as white unemployment. However, rates of unemployment among Hispanic American males was significantly higher than any other demographic. When we review the data with women, we see similar patterns. Hispanic women showing the largest increase in unemployment during this pandemic. Now, what data has been analyzed to account for the discrepancies between communities of color and the general population? In general, people of color live in more crowded living conditions. Chronic diseases like obesity, diabetes, hypertension are found more in people of color. People of color have less access to good health care. Higher levels of air and water pollution are found in communities of color. People of color work in higher risk occupations and often these occupations cannot be done from home. So this is when I would like to take a closer look at the origins of few of these risk factors. Why is it that communities of color have more risk factors than the general populace? To quote Isabel Wilkerson from her award-winning book, Cast, America is an old house. We are like homeowners who inherited a house on a piece of land that is beautiful on the outside, but whose soil is unstable loom and rock, heaving and contracting over generations. Cracks patched, but the deeper ruptures waved away for decades, centuries even. We are heirs to whatever is right or wrong with it. We did not erect the uneven pillars or joists, but they are ours to deal with now. The owner of the old house knows what whatever you're ignoring will never go away. Ignorance is no protection from the consequence of inaction. So how does history contribute to these disparities? Now let's start with the first risk factor, crowded living conditions. What cracks can we find in our house's foundation? We can start in the not too distant past with the Great Depression and the New Deal. Let me start by saying the New Deal was progressive for its time. However, its policies on housing are directly responsible for limiting housing options for people of color. In response to the Great Depression, the Federal Housing Agency developed programs to create housing for middle and lower class families through subsidies. These subsidies were granted to builders to build in the suburbs if homes were not sold to Black Americans. Consequently, Black Americans were pushed into urban housing projects. Now these policies were not unwritten, but in fact documented in written law. Here are a couple of examples from the Federal Housing Agency Underwriting Manual, 1934. If a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that the property shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. A change in social or racial occupancy generally leads to instability and a reduction in values. Prohibition of the occupancy of properties except by the race for which they were intended. So we can only imagine that there are plenty of ways to keep people of color confined to specific areas and limit their access to the suburbs. Black Americans could not easily move out of these delineated areas, which brings us to the next issue, redlining. Mortgages were given to prospective homeowners through the government-backed Homeowners Loan Corporation. They refused to ensure risky mortgages in areas and around red zones, which were predominantly black neighborhoods. This is how the term redlining came to be. 
This was a near impossible obstacle to get past for Black Americans who wanted to move out of the cities or into the suburbs. In the long run, this inability to own land prevented many Black Americans from acquiring wealth through real estate, which was a boon for many white families. This wealth was passed on from generation to generation, allowing parents to send their children to college, establish businesses, acquire more land, and more. This wealth gap continues to exist today with people of color owning one-tenth the wealth compared to white families, despite salaries that are only 35% lower. So how does this relate to COVID-19? Large communities of color reside in urban areas. And these urban areas have a much higher population density. This population density causes several issues. Social distancing is more difficult. Viruses spread more rapidly in confined areas like elevators, stairwells, and lobbies. Folks who live in the cities make more use of public transportation, which is another potential source of spread. And higher levels of both air and water pollution have been shown to increase COVID risks. Let's move on to the second risk factor, chronic disease. Now, while lifestyle and genetics do play a role in one's health, is there any data to suggest that other factors might play a role? We recently watched a PBS special with our staff at Hyde Park called When the Bow Breaks. This documentary follows a physician and their research to determine why Black American women have more complications with pregnancy. Black American women have two and a half times higher incidence of infant mortality and one and a half time higher incident of preterm labor than white American women. However, when they looked at African immigrants, these African immigrants to the US didn't have these high rates. Their rates were similar. Their rate, their rate of birth complications were similar as white American women. Within one generation of living in the United States, outcomes for the African born group worsen and become comparable to black American women. On average, the higher on the socioeconomic scale you are, the lower your risk of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, infant death, and preterm deliveries. However, for highly educated Black women, the advantages of income and status do not make a difference. So what were their conclusions? They concluded that there was something unique about the Black American experience when compared to other countries. Their theory was that racism in the United States is an everyday stressor for people of color. This causes a baseline increase in stress. When stressed, the natural response is to release the hormone cortisol. And cortisol, when released chronically, can lead to hypertension and organ damage and other problems. Other factors that they didn't mention may include less access to healthy foods in communities of color and an increased marketing of unhealthy products like fast food, alcohol, and cigarettes in community of color. We'll take a final historical perspective on the third risk factor, access or lack thereof to healthcare. <clears throat> I'd like to focus on why there's a general distrust of the American healthcare system, especially among Black Americans. This distrust comes from historical precedent and also racial disparities in the equality of give care given to people of color, which still exists today. Torture and experimentation on Black Americans through history is not uncommon. A good example is Dr. J. Marion Sims, also known as the father of modern gynecology. He experimented on enslaved black women in the 1840s. Since these women were enslaved, they were given no choice on whether they could participate or not. He performed experimental surgeries to create a procedure to fix vaginal fistulas. Subjects often underwent multiple procedures with no anesthesia. This doctor performed these procedures with no compassion. It's reported that some of his subjects underwent as many as 30 separate surgeries. A more recent example of this was the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. As a reminder, this was a study of 600 black men, most with latent syphilis infections. They were enrolled into a study under false pretense. The study was supposed to last six months, but ended lasting 40 years. Investigators took advantage of poorer and less educated black men and promised them free medical care and meals. They were never told their diagnosis and were given false tests and treatments, 
including painful spinal taps that cause long-term side effects for many of the participants. For those of you who don't know, syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease, which if untreated can lead to debilitating neurological disease and in many cases, death. Not only that, but the infected men spread this disease to their partners and then to their offspring. 13 years into this 40 year study, penicillin was found to be an effective cure. Participants were never treated or offered treatment. Over the lifetime of the study, inquiries were made several times about the ethics involved and funding was even pulled. But even up until 1969, efforts were still being made by the investigators to continue the study. It wasn't until 1972, when the first public articles came out that the study was condemned and stopped. No apology was ever given. Distrust in the healthcare system continues today, and for good reason. People of color from all socioeconomic groups and all backgrounds have stories of receiving substandard care. With recent events in the United States, data from some of these studies has become more prominent. In a study of 400 hospitals in the United States, it was shown that black patients with heart disease receive older, cheaper, and more conservative treatments than their white counterparts. In a study from 1992 to 2015, black newborn babies in the United States were three times more likely to die when than their white counterparts. What was concerning was that if the attending physician of a black infant was also black, the infant's chance of death was the same as white infants, especially in medical complex, complex medical cases. In fact, there have been multiple studies showing racial and ethnic minorities receive lower quality health care than white people, even when insurance, status, income, age, and severity of conditions are comparable. So it's no surprise that there is a lack of faith in our health system. Finally, Let's take a look at the last two factors which account for the difference in rates of COVID-19 infection among people of color. High-risk occupations, which often cannot be done from home. Essential workers in the setting such as healthcare facilities, factories, accommodation and food services, grocery stores, and public transportation are disproportionately performed by people of color. These professions are face-to-face -face and cannot be done from home they require continued contact with the public, which increases chance of exposure. So what can we do? I hope during this talk, I've given a small taste of the obstacles we face in the pandemic in communities of color. The obstacles we face are difficult, but not insurmountable. It's my hope that policies of the future will consider not only why communities of color are more vulnerable in a pandemic, but how these communities were established and how that has led to their vulnerability. To quote Joe Couder, in order to plan your future wisely, it is necessary that you understand and appreciate your past. Unfortunately, this will not be the last pandemic and I can only hope that policies developed in the future will take this into account. However, that will take some time. In the meantime, the single most effective tool we can combat COVID-19 with in our communities is to get vaccinated. I can't stress that more. We need to get vaccinated. Vaccine hesitancy threatens to make COVID-19 a way of life. If we don't achieve herd immunity, COVID will continue to mutate and be a constant concern and fear for everyone. In other words, COVID will never go away. In Massachusetts, only 35% of Black residents and 27% of Hispanic residents have been vaccinated. This is compared to 51% of white Massachusetts re residents. Without herd immunity, the effect of COVID will increase, especially in urban populations due to all the reasons we discussed earlier. There were valid reasons for hesitancy early in the phase of vaccination but there are over 100 million Americans fully vaccinated and 250 million doses have been given to date. If we fail to vaccinate, the pandemic will continue and communities of color will suffer the most. Now in my practice, I discuss this vaccine with families every day. And I thought I would address some of the common myths associated with the COVID-19 vaccine. The COVID vaccine was developed too quickly. 
It should be known that researchers have been working with mRNA vaccines for decades. Older vaccines were not released to the public until research determined how long immunity lasted and the best booster schedule for that vaccine. In some cases, this took years. Due to the severity of the pandemic, the longevity of immunity and the booster time schedule for the COVID vaccines is being determined in real time. Another reason previous vaccines were released slower was that many vaccines were replacing older vaccines and they needed to be studied to ensure that they were more effective than the vaccines that they replaced. The COVID vaccine modifies your DNA. Absolutely not. Uh, mRNA does not interact with your DNA in any form. mRNA functions like a mes messenger with a set of instructions. These instructions work with ribosomes. Think of it as a 3D printer, which creates a protein. After creating the protein, mRNA degrades in the body within minutes. The protein your body creates looks similar to a protein found covering the COVID-19 virus. By displaying this protein to your immune system, it learns what COVID-19 looks like so it can recognize it quickly if you're exposed to COVID in the future. We don't know the long-term side effects of the vaccine. Of all the vaccines ever released by us, significant side effects were found within six weeks of starting the vaccine. We are well past that phase with our COVID vaccines. The COVID vaccine will affect my fertility. Early rumors of this have proven to be false and plenty of women have gotten the vaccine both before and during their pregnancies. Taking the vaccine will make my immune system weaker. Now this is far from correct. Your immune system will still have to recognize and kill the virus if exposed. Getting the vaccine simply gives your immune system a head start. Think of it as getting the opposing team's playbook before the game. Also, your immune system is bombarded by different proteins and microbes every day. Getting the COVID vaccine won't stop your immune system from getting a proper workout. I'm healthy, so I don't need to get vaccinated. There are two reasons to get this vaccine. One is to protect yourself. There are plenty of healthy young people who have gotten COVID and suffered long-term side effects. This includes heart problems, chronic fatigue, debilitating headaches, and unfortunately, these are more severe in younger people and in people of color. The second reason is to be a pillar in your community. Unvaccinated individuals risk spreading the virus to others and risk becoming repositories where the virus can continue to spread and mutate. Getting vaccinated helps to protect your community, helps to protect your friends, and helps to protect your loved ones. It will take decades to resolve many of the risk factors which exist in the communities of color. But in the here and now, getting vaccinated is the single best thing we can do to protect our communities. Thank you for taking time to listen tonight. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I'm open to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Primey. It was an excellent presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions that have come in. Alex, do you wanna get us started? Sure. Uh, one of the questions is, can you talk about the death rates of children? We've been told that children were not impacted by the virus. No, so that's that's completely false. When you talk about different age groups, definitely children have had less death rates than adults have, but there have definitely been deaths with children. Um, so that's and also with children, now that we're seeing more children be affected as adults get immunized, we are finding that there are long-term complications with the children. So when children can be vaccinated, they, you should definitely get them vaccinated, but COVID is not harmless to children's in any stretch of the imagination. Thank you. Okay, our next question um, that's come in, what will happen if I only take one of the two vaccinations? Um, generally, so if you get one vaccine, your body does recognize COVID and gets an immune response, but your immune response will be less. So instead of it lasting for a year or two years, it might only last a month or two months. And if you get exposed, your body might not make a quick enough response for you to not get sick. So when you've had two vaccines, the studies have shown that 95%, which is amazing, uh, have no symptoms at all. You never even know you were exposed to it. Whereas if you have one, um, you might have symptoms, you might be contagious and spread it. So I recommend getting both vaccines um, 
definitely follow the, the guidance for that. I'm going to uh, jump to this question related to vaccines again. Uh, does it matter which vaccine I take? No, get whatever vaccine you can get a, a, available. Um, also related to vaccines, and you mentioned it before you talked about the booster. Can you speak a little bit about um, how often you think we would need the booster um, and where we are with the process of the booster? Yeah, so that's one of the reasons why, you know, COVID came out quickly is because we don't know exactly when we'll need to be boosted. So as far as the data with Pfizer, as far as we know right now, people who got the Pfizer vaccine are still have a strong enough immune response. So we're talking about at least eight months out from the first crop that we're getting it in the study. Uh, so it really depends. It, you know, it could be a year, it could be longer, but that's what's going to take longer to determine exactly how long immunity lasts for all these vaccines. Thank you. And on that note also, if the strains were the strains that are existing right now, we probably, the booster probably would take longer, but boosting might also be a way to account for new strains. So as long as COVID is out there mutating, it makes it more likely that we're gonna to have to get boosted more often. Thank you. Um, I noticed in one of your slides, Dr. Framey, that um, the, the slide that um, talked across the 43 states there, that the yes. population um, has a really high percentage of- The which population? The Asian population seems to yes. have pretty high. Like when you look across, in some mm -hmm. they're even higher than mm -hmm. um, white people. Um, yes. Being just vaccinated at a higher rate. Do, why do you think that is? What, anything behind that? Uh, you know, I really don't know. I, I can tell the reason why it's lower in the other groups and we discussed some of those. And I think um, that sort of information, trust of medical, um, the medical community is higher with Asian population. Asian population also is, uh, as far as um, uh, ethnic groups, one of the richer uh, groups that have better access to healthcare and a higher educated. So all those would account for a reason why they higher vaccination rates. Thank you. So I just would like to remind folks who are uh, watching this uh, discussion that if they would like to ask a question, they have to put it into the question and answer uh, um, feature. And then we will be sure to ask the question. Um, next question. Have you talked, um, can you talk a little bit about how trust has been changing uh, between the Black community and I'll also add the Latino community uh, with respect to the medical profession? Well, I think there's a lot more, um, uh, there's, a, I, I'm losing my words, um, there's a lot more transparency. Um, and there is an effort to, to recognize where these issues are. I think one of the big things that a lot of the organizations are doing is uh, going through the data. Now we have, everyone's on electronic medical records. Most demogra demographics are there. You can see what kind of treatments you have. So it's very easy now for anyone to sort of do a deep dive into exactly what treatments were given to what people. And uh, I think the transparency will help in the long run. But there's been a concerted effort in at least most of the major hospitals in, 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 um, in Boston to really address this. Dr. Bayami, do we know when the study was done of the 400 hospitals um, in the US that where the black patients were receiving kind of that older, cheaper treatment? Do we know I don't know. It's an older study because I've heard that for a while. It's not one relative, it's not like in the 2010 and before. It's a, I'm pretty sure it's an older study because I've read that several times in the past. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dr. Feynman, has there been any evidence that there are people who have a natural immunity to COVID? And if, if so, uh, is there some understanding as to why? Well, when you talk about any disease, there's no one who has a natural immunity to anything. Your, your, if your immune system has never seen it before, there's no way you have immunity to it. Some people might, their immune system might just be quicker 
to deal with the virus. So that's the same thing as you would say, a asymptomatic carrier is someone who gets the virus and deals with it so quickly um, that it really never becomes an issue for them. So um, it's not something that I would risk to see if you're one of those people because you might do really well with strep and really well with flu, but really poorly with COVID um, because they're, everyone treats viruses differently. Everyone's immune system reacts a little bit differently. So I don't believe there's anything in anything, any kind of illness that is natural immunity. How can we get more involved to enact healthcare policy changes to support communities of color? I'm definitely not a policy maker. So I don't, you know, I look at it and I, I, I don't know. It seems like there's just so much that needs to be done. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I look to more people who deal with policy and public health and who really are trained to go and look at the racial implicit bias, the racial disparities and make concrete plans to change how that, how, that, how um, medicine deals with people of color. So another question is asking if you are aware of how um, uh, folks can get more involved to enact um, better healthcare policies for to support our communities of color. I was thinking about your presentation regarding Black and Latino families not receiving COVID. Is there any ideas on how we as a community can support uh, folks uh, to really get the word out to get the COVID shot? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's all about education and we need to know people who live in those communities need to know what what methods people get most of their information from and use those sources to get people informed on what is what the benefits of COVID vaccine are and um, how it's going to help. I don't think, you know, listening to, you know, the news, local news or CNN is the way that if that's not the way the community disseminates information, then that's not the way um, the way it needs to be done. I do think, you know, there's some responsibility for other physicians of color to do things like this, give talks, go to places, talk to the community. I think face-to-face -face meeting as much as you can in a, in a pandemic is nice to get information out to folks. But I think you need to use whatever each community uses for information to disseminate true information about the COVID vaccine. We just had another question come in. Do you know if there's any correlation between the severity of symptoms someone initially has and whether they will have long-term consequences and lingering symptoms. So that's, it's kind of a two-parter, so I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's definitely, um, there's definitely a relationship between how severe your disease with and whether you'll have long-term um, issues. So uh, children who have fever for, you know, we have mild, moderate, and severe, um, categories. So kids who have moderate symptoms usually are more likely have cardiac issues. So we have to do tests before they can go to sports and so on and so forth. As far as the initial, if you're sick for two days, really sick, and then you're fine after, I don't think there's any data to suggest uh, that you're going to be a long hauler. Uh, there is a very rare multi-inflammatory syndrome, and that has nothing to do with the severity of symptoms, but it's also exceedingly rare. Um, that's the syndrome where you have the fever, uh, the swelling, uh, red eyes, and a, a bunch of other symptoms uh, two weeks or so after you had COVID. So you kind of answered, so low symptom um, infection, you're saying won't be a long hauler. Would the same hold true if you're asymptomatic? So do people who are asymptomatic, um, you, they don't have to worry about any kind of long-term anything at all? Um, um, I don't know for, I, no, I don't think you'll be a long hormone if you have asymptomatic, but then the, that weird multi-inflammatory um, um, syndrome can happen to younger kids who are asymptomatic. Thank you. But like I said, exceedingly rare. Um, do you know if someone who had COVID and gets the vaccine, will this person have more protection in the long term, or perhaps, and, and then perhaps not need a booster? So they won't know um, whether you'll need a booster or not, but they have definitely shown studies that people who have had COVID and then get the vaccine 
have a very good response to the vaccine and make a lot of antibodies, which protects them well. So um, whether you'll need a booster, like I said, there's two reasons why you need a booster. One is if your immunity wanes or gets less and less, or two, there's new strains that you haven't been exposed to, so you need to be boosted for those strains. So even if you had a great response, if there's a new strain in the next winter, everyone will have to get boosted whether they had COVID before or not because they wouldn't have been exposed to the new strain. So in the, in the next season, it's likely we'll have to get a COVID booster, a flu shot. Um, it's, it's possible, but that's, <laughs> but that's the reason. If we can get the population immunized to a high enough level, it's very possible that we wouldn't need a COVID booster because COVID would just go away. Uh, especially with a vaccine that's 95% effective. So COVID could be the next smallpox or the next mumps, measles, and rubella, chickenpox, those things, those vaccines are though, that effective that those diseases are extremely rare. Um, so if we get most of the population vaccinated, we might not need boosters. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You talked about um, the side effects kind of varying in duration, right? How long it would last. Um, but what are some of the side effects? We have someone who would like um, some of- Of the vaccine or of the, of the disease? Uh, looks like of the virus. Of the virus. So the one we worry about most is the um, heart problems. So you can have, you can develop heart failure. You can have inflammation in your heart, fluid around your heart. Um, you can have chronic uh, uh, respiratory issues so that you don't, your lungs don't function as well as they used to. Um, you can have people who have migraines, they are, can have severe migraines for a long time after um, getting COVID. Um, you can get chronic fatigue. There's some people who just overall just are achy, can't move, just are not at the level that they were before. Um, so those are the most critical side effects of COVID. There are some data to suggest that if you have COVID and have some of these long-term effects, the vaccine actually gets rid of those effects, which no one understands why, but some of these people who have gotten vaccinated months after suffering from these symptoms get better suddenly. Uh, can you help explain why um, sometimes when you're, I mentioned you know, the, um, the flu vaccine, why between mm -hmm. vaccines, you need to have some time uh, before you take one to the other some folks are taking the, um, the, the chicken pox vaccine for if you're over 50, for example, and yeah. um, what, what things can you do at the same time and what you can't and why? I'm not sure I understand the question. So you, if you, for example, if you got the flu vaccine, you have to wait two to three weeks uh, before you mm -hmm. can get an, uh, one of the COVID vaccines, and then you have to take wait another two to three weeks to take the next COVID vaccine, or if you have to mm -hmm. take the chickenpox vaccine, that you have to wait another couple of weeks, three weeks. Why do we have to spread those all out? Yeah, so there's different sort of interactions. It really depends on what you're talking about. The COVID vaccine, after you get the COVID vaccine, you're not supposed to get any other kind of vaccine for two weeks. Um, and I believe that's just because we want your body to respond and produce antibodies to COVID. If you get a vaccine, especially with live vaccines, if you get a live vaccine, which is like mumps, measles, or rubella, or the chickenpox, and then you get one, um, you get another live vaccine too soon, you probably just don't respond to the second vaccine. So that's why they don't want you getting the, those two vaccines close together. Does that answer the question? Yes. So basically it's let your body do what it's gotta do. Um, before you get the next vaccine. But if you're doing two at the same time, a lot of times your body can deal with two at the same, exactly the same time. But if you get it later, you might not respond to the second one as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the next question is about the side effects of the vaccination. Um, yes. What are those? And then how long should they last about? Yeah, so side effects of the vaccine, um, and this is more from personal experience and from people around me. The first vaccine, if you're doing one of the two dose ones, usually not much. A lot of people complain of a, a really swollen or painful arm 
Um, for that, I suggest after you get the vaccine, one, drink a lot of water before you get the vaccine, and two, move that arm a lot. Even if it's not sore in the beginning, if you just kind of sit there two hours, three hours later, it's going to be really sore. So move the arm around. The second dose, most people I know at least had some fatigue for an hour or two, low grade temperature, like 100 chills, or just, I felt just kind of, ugh, uh, you know, probably 18 to 20 hours after the vaccine for about two or three hours. And that's very common. And that just means your immune system is doing what it's do, it's supposed to do. Um, some people, rare, will get high fever, won't feel good for like a whole day, but it's worth it to know that you won't get, you won't get those symptoms when you get exposed, if you get exposed to COVID. And Dr. Price, I usually suggest do it on a weekend if you can. Okay, on a weekend. And the, there's equity with the side effects of the vaccination, right? So it's not one yeah. suffering from side effects more than another, correct? No, no, not at all. One, you know, one good thing about the COVID vaccine um, is that there was definitely a lot of transparency as to who was getting the vaccine, what ethnic groups were, and what the side effects were. So definitely from the start, a lot of times this racial uh, inequity and more recently is just from, from not thinking that one ethnic group might react differently than the other. So you give it to a whole bunch of a homogeneous ethnic group uh, and then you give a new treatment and it affects a different ethnic group differently. So I think this vaccine, they're very cognizant of that and made sure that eth all ethnic groups were represented in the studies before it was released uh, to the public. Alex, is there any other question coming in? Uh, I don't think so. We might be at the last one. Um, I have one to add. Um, sure. So it, uh, just thinking about your slide um, that talked about the birth rate. I, it's it's so distressing to see. It is. Um, I, one of those stats you listed was right up through 2015. I mean, like that was around the corner, right? Like, or just not too long ago, rather. So, mm -hmm. um, as a mother of a young black daughter who eventually wants to have children of her own one day. Um, mm -hmm. I say that there's, you know, some fear that I have with that. I'm fearful for her, feel for, fearful yeah. for the baby. Um, so it is our best bet to kind of seek out <laughs> um, an African-American doctor or a doctor of color, um, or if, if not, and we have a white doctor, she has a white doctor, what questions can we ask? to kind of build that trust and make sure that we have a doctor that really cares about mm -hmm. health um, and yeah. that successful birth will take place. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a hard question. Like, I don't think you should, if you're at somewhere and you're, there's a doctor who is, you know, African-American doctor, sure, it's great. Doesn't necessarily mean that things will be better for you. You know, you, chances are they'll at least be a little bit more empathic to what you go through. Um, but I think it's more about questioning what's going on, you know, what options do I have, especially if things are not, if it's not straightforward, what are my options, there's something going wrong, what would you do for your child, you know, so just kind of, just to keep reminding the doctor that you're a human being, and that what would you do for your family? What would you do, you know, so just keep bringing it back, because there's just so much implicit bias that's that people don't even realize that they have, you know? Um, so that would be my question is just to, well, my, my, my um, advice, ask questions, keep asking questions, keep asking about alternatives, especially when there's more illness involved. Because a lot of those studies were, the more medically complex it got, the more the, dif you know, the differentiation became. So I think in that point, you need to start asking questions. I, I'm a question asker just naturally. Um, but when you say, bring it back to I'm, I'm a human. Um, if yeah. you're still feeling that disconnect between yourself and this medical provider, is it appropriate to, to say, I, I'm gonna need to go somewhere else, you know? And I, th absolutely, I think absolutely, absolutely. I, you know, I, I think there's, especially somewhere like Boston, there's lots of doctors, um, you know, definitely give them a chance. Everyone has a bad day, but, um, I think if you're not, if you're feeling uncomfortable or you're feeling um, pushed aside, then I think it's something you have to really think about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, Alex?
I don't see any that's come into the, the Q and A. Um, and I, I hope we didn't miss any. Um, we did certainly get a lot of excellent questions this evening. Um, if there's anything else, certainly you have a, a few seconds here to type something in and send it over. Um, there's a little time remaining. Um, there was a comment um, about if this um, recording um, will be made public and it will, um, it will be on the Needham channel uh, YouTube. So uh, you can find it here if you would like to, to watch it again or to share it. Um, so that will be available. So I know someone um, did ask about that. And some personal thank yous to you, Dr. Fiamme, um, that came over through the Q&A. Um, thank you for um, educating the community on this important topic. And um, I concur. Um, that's it's certainly um, so, so very important. So again, just a lot of thank yous coming in right now. So I think we might be done um, with the sure. Q&A portion. Um, so just thank you all for joining us this evening uh, for this community event. We were so happy to have hosted it um, and we hope it was beneficial for you all. And thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. So long. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fireman. Thank you, Alex. You're welcome. Thank Have you. a great Ready. night. Bye.